Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Paper Magician by Charlie N. Holmberg. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so that you'll be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support BBC, you can do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. One, you can become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So, without further ado, let's continue. The Paper Magician, Chapter 16 As wind rushed over her aching body and numb hands, Sienny's mind drifted back to Emery's home. Her home. What if he had passed on while she'd been away? What if she had been too slow? Could an animated heart revive an inanimate body? His heart fluttered weakly against hers, having lost much of its lingering strength since she lifted it from the enchanted pool. But she still had time. Surely she still had time. Stories like this one weren't meant to end badly. Magician Avioski, Hughes, and Catter would have noted her absence by now, but she found herself not caring for whatever repercussions they could offer her. She didn't regret her decision. Even if her clumsy paper heart didn't pull Emery through this, she prayed her folding had held up. The magicians had at least left the giant door in Emery's roof open. The glider swooped up and landed gracefully, even without her directing it. It knew its master's house. Sienny pulled stiff fingers from its handles, massaging them against her hip to coax movement back into her knuckles. Her head felt full of clouds, but not in the dreamy sense, just the empty one. The floorboards creaked under her feet. Her bag swung at her side like a broken pendulum from a derelict grandfather clock, and she felt as if she were made of paper herself. She leaned on the stairwell wall just as she descended down to the second floor, holding Emery's heart to her breast, its small vitality chain soaked in red. She had left her shoe wedged between the rocks of the island shore, not wanting to stay any longer than was absolutely necessary. Her sore, socked foot muffled every other step. She passed Emery's room, the door ajar and the bed empty. They must not have moved him. He was downstairs, still alive, waiting for her. They wouldn't have buried him without her. She hadn't been gone that long. Had she? Past the library, the lavatory, her bedroom, she leaned on the wall as she took the stairs to the first floor. Magician Avioski opened the door, eight steps below her. "'See any twill!' she exclaimed with all the anxiety of a worried mother, the sternness of an academy principal, and the relief of a farmer feeling spring's first rain on his skin. Her eyes widened, round as dinner chargers. Sienny must have been a sight to see. Magician Avioski's face paled and she started up the steps, but Sienny's words made her pause. I'm not hurt, she said, and she wasn't, not really. The blood running down her blouse wasn't hers. She gently pulled Emery's heart from beneath her collar. Magician Avioski pressed a hand to her mouth. That isn't, she whispered through her fingers. Sienny took the last eight steps down, pushing past Magician Avioski, who didn't stop her. Sienny didn't have the energy for an argument. Not right now. She saw no trace of Magician's hues and catter. Her own heart quickened at the sight of Emery, the real Emery lying in his makeshift bed on the dining room floor just as she had left him. His skin almost held the pallor of death, his lips were almost violet, and his eyes were almost sunken. Almost, but not quite. Her paper heart still beat within his chest. Magician Avioski closed the stairway door and asked the question surfacing in Sienny's own mind. Will it work? I don't know, Sienny whispered. It scared her that a magician as experienced as Avioski would ask that. What if it didn't? She walked around to Emery's left side and knelt beside him. She held his heart in one hand and reopened his shirt with the other. His flesh felt cool, but not cold. There's still magic left in it, she said. 
She knew only because no heart could beat on its own without its body, not without a spell, and Lyra's magic had been strong. Hopefully it would be enough. She placed the heart upon his chest. His skin glimmered with the gold residue of Lyra's spell, and the cavity opened. The sight of an open chest would have terrified Sienny had she not just lived in one, more or less. How long was I gone? she asked as her paper heart greeted her with a feeble, soggy pulse. One night, Magician Avioski answered, barely audible. Sienny nodded. Reaching into Emery's still warm chest, she pulled out her paper heart and pressed his own back into place. Emery's back arched and he sucked in a rush of air. The cavity closed so suddenly Sienny barely had time to pull her fingers free. The golden glimmer vanished. Sienny held her breath. Emery remained still, asleep. Pressing her ear to his chest, she listened for the heartbeat. It met her with a drowsy but steady pom pom pom. She smiled. She didn't have the strength to do anything more. He'll be all right, just but call a doctor, she said, her voice light and airy. She thought she sounded like a child. She smoothed Emery's hair back from his forehead and, though Magician Avioski watched from the foot of the bed, leaned down to kiss him on the cheek. Miss Twill, Avioski began as C and E stood, but the woman didn't finish her sentence, whatever it may have been. Perhaps because C and E looked so terrible. Perhaps because Magician Avioski saw this as a good deed. Perhaps it was the way C and E's legs shook as though they'd aged one hundred years in the space of one night. Magician Avioski's gaze prickled C and E's back as C and E stepped away from Magician Emery Thane pulled herself up the stairs, and collapsed into her own bed. Sienny awoke with lead bones and a mild headache in the center of her forehead. Soreness had settled into her muscles, her legs and forearms especially, warning her of further soreness on the morrow. She felt her pulse tickling hot spots on her back where she had skidded across the rock shelf along the Falmouth coast. Her stomach, though it felt quite small, chortled in protest for food, and she had hardly enough saliva in her mouth to swallow. Someone handed her a glass of water. She didn't recognize the man kneeling at her bedside, but Magician Avioski stood behind him and helped Sienny prop herself up on a pillow. Sienny drained the cup in four and a half gulps and thirsted for more. She noticed the conical stethoscope around the stranger's neck. He looked about fifty, with thorough hair loss and round lens spectacles, and concluded he was the doctor she had asked Magician Avioski to retrieve. She hadn't intended the doctor for her own use. Morning light in the window told her she'd been asleep for some time. Dehydration, the doctor said, pressing his finger into Sienny's wrist then watching to see how long his white print took to recolor, and quite scratched, and in need of a bath. But you'll certainly survive, Miss Twill. Sienny cleared her throat. M. Thane. Magician Thane, she stuttered, feeling her cheeks heat under Magician Avioski's scrutiny. Is he all right? Magician Avioski said, as you predetermined, Miss Twill, he will be healthy after a few days' rest. Dr. Newbold has affirmed it. Releasing a long breath of relief, Sienny sunk down into her pillow. Dr. Newbold leaned forward and touched his stethoscope to her chest with no formality, but doctors tended to be quite familiar. Nodding his head once, he said, Liquids and soft food for twenty-four hours. If you have to chew it, don't eat it, unless you want a cramp. He rifled through a short-handled bag on the floor, one that had been patched several times, for C and he noticed the stitchings along its seams were three distinctly different shades of black. From the bag, Dr. Newbold pulled a shallow jar of green gel. It looked like the aloe cream the nurse at Tagus Pref always kept on the third shelf of the medicine cabinet between beds one and two. This will help your abrasions heal more swiftly, he explained. 
twice a day, or whenever they sting. And imp, magician Thane, she asked. No abrasions on him, Dr. Newbold answered. Magic wounds are a strange sort. Tricky. If he acts oddly after he wakes, call me back. He held up a finger as a warning. And let him wake on his own. The body often knows what it needs without our meddling. But how will I know if he's acting strange? Sini asked. He's strange already. Magician Avioski clucked her tongue and Sini felt herself smiling. When Magician Avioski clucked again, Sini wiped the grin from her face and managed to force a flush down into her chest where the magician wouldn't see it. To the doctor, Magician Avioski said, Will you return tonight to check on his progress? Dr. Newbold shook his head in the negative. No, no, I don't believe it's necessary. He seems stable to me, especially now that he's in his own bed. I don't like patients lying on the floor unless they absolutely must. I can tend to him, Sienny said, sitting up. Her back ached as she did. I don't mind, and it's just watching to make sure nothing seems amiss, right? she asked, glancing from the doctor to Magician Avioski. I'm his apprentice, and I'm all right, and I know you're busy, Magician Avioski. Magician Avioski pursed her lips into a thin line, but Sienny wasn't sure if it was in regard to her statement or not. Magician Avioski always looked pursed. Things have gone from very hectic to very calm very quickly, the magician said. It disconcerts me. But if you believe it as well, Dr. Newbold, I suppose I'll be wont to agree with you. It's well, the doctor said, closing his bag and standing with a grunt. His right knee popped as he did so. But telegram, if anything does go amiss. Me as well, Magician Avioski said to Sienny, clasping her hands behind her back. She still wore the same clothes she had donned when first responding to Sienny's call, and Sienny found herself grateful not only for the woman's quick response, but also that she had stayed beside Emery when the others had left him for dead. Sienny smiled. Of course. I'll let you know any and every change, Magician Avioski. I promise it. Magician Avioski smiled as much as her stern countenance would allow. I'm glad to hear it. I apologize for this incident disrupting your learning. She looked at Sienny with a critical eye. I admit I'm not a fan of mixed genders in apprenticeships, and our only other folders are likewise male, but I'm willing to consider reassignment. Sienny bit down on her tongue to keep from blurting an adamant no at the very idea. Instead, she calmly, politely said, Magician Thane has been a good teacher thus far, and very patient with me. I'd like to continue apprenticing under him as far as the situation allows. Magician Avioski nodded, a fraction of skepticism marring her otherwise poised visage. But she said nothing. Dr. Newbold, she said, turning to the man who stood at eye level with her. Thank you for your time. I'll send your bill through the cabinet. If you would excuse us. Sienny chewed on her lip as the doctor nodded and left. She had assumed Magician Avioski would go with him. What more was there to say? Once Dr. Newbold had departed, Magician Avioski sat straight-backed on the edge of Sienny's narrow bed and said, Tell me precisely what happened. Sienny curled in on herself. I'm rather hungry, Magician... Is it so long a story? Magician Avioski interrupted. You fled the premises against instruction to pursue an excisioner. She gasped at the very idea. And yet you not only survived, but rescued the heart of perhaps the most talented folder in England. I deserve the details, Miss Twill. You didn't instruct me to stay, Sienny countered, just to leave the dining room which I did. Magician Avioski rubbed the bridge of her nose under her glasses. This feels very much like detention again, Sienny. It's just... private, I guess, she replied. 
Private? the magician repeated, obviously surprised at seeing his choice of adjective. How so? What is so private that you can't tell me? She paled. You didn't bargain. No, no, Sienny said, glancing down to her hands, to the blood underneath her nails. In her mind's eye, she saw Lyra's frozen form, hands clutching her bleeding eye. Blood magic, Sienny thought. Does that make me an excisioner too? It was the thought Sienny hadn't dared consider until now. What would Magician Avioski and the Magician's Cabinet do if they knew how Sienny had defeated Lyra? Looking away from Magician Avioski's eyes, Sienny said, I took Magician Thane's glider, it's in the attic, and I used a bird scout, a paper bird that is, to follow Lyra. She must have seen the glider and gotten scared and fled. I chased her to the coast where she had taken camp and I tracked her to the water. I think she escaped. I... I saw a boat in the water. It might have been for her. Magician Avioski raised one brow. And she left the heart behind. Sienny nodded. Foolish to come all this way and leave the very objective of her attack in the camp, Magician Avioski said. I'll trace your coordinates and send some detectives in. Sienny's breath caught at this. She hoped Magician Avioski didn't notice. I think I'd like to rest now, Sienny managed. She was unsure of what anyone would find on that beach. Had the men taken Lyra or left her? And eat. I can look at a map and guess where the camp was. Telegram you the location tonight, perhaps. By some time. Magician Avioski appeared suspicious, but she exceeded. Sienny was, after all, one of her best students, detention or no. Another purse of the lips in Magician Avioski stood and said, I want them by tonight, unless you want the cabinet hounding you. Magician Hughes is a very impatient man and keen on details. She adjusted her glasses. I'll leave the buggy running, just in case she said, and took her leave. Leaning against the warm glass of the window, Sienny waited until Magician Avioski passed through the paper charms disguising the cottage's appearance before she rose from bed and padded lightly to Emery's room. The door creaked loudly as she opened it. Emery lay still atop his bed, two blankets covering him, curtains drawn, she opened them halfway to give him some sunlight. He looked healthier, ruddier. I'm not sure what to do, she admitted, watching his chest rise and fall with every steady breath. I have to tell Magician Avioski where. I don't want to talk to the cabinet. But I left her there on the rocks. I didn't know if writing it would work, but the blood made some sort of connection, and it did she said, rubbing her left arm absently. But I'm not like her. Please don't think I'm like her. Moving to his bedside, she squeezed his warm hand briefly before making her way to the lavatory to clean up. She never wanted to look at another's blood again if she could help it. Before she went to bed, she pulled an old edition atlas from one of Magician Thane's many bookshelves, and telegrammed a rough span of coordinates to Magician Avioski. She had a hard time sleeping after that.